Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to uh, join uh, Senator Capito in calling this uh, business meeting to order as we prepare to consider uh, two nominations, a waste uh, infrastructure, waste water, a water infrastructure bill, rather, and legislation to honor a barrier-breaking leader in transportation. First, uh, let me say that I'm delighted and grateful that we're voting today on important water legislation that is the result of months of collaboration by members of this committee on both sides of the aisle and the hard, working, uh, the hard work of the members of both staffs. The, uh, the Drinking Water and Wastewater uh, Infrastructure Act increases our government's commitment to providing safe and resilient water systems to cities and communities, both large and small. I especially want to uh, thank uh, the, uh, some of the members of the, uh, well, I call the water staff, the water team on the majority side, John Keane, Andy D'Amato, uh, Mackie McIntosh, uh, Lizzie Olson, Lizzie and uh, with uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, on the minority side, uh, Travis, thank you, Jess uh, Kramer, and Adam Stewart, who I believe works for Senator Lummis, I think. Yeah. This bill uh, authorizes funding for the EPA, uh, EPA's Clean Water and Safe Drinking Water State Revolving Funds and directs resources, particularly to disadvantaged to rural and tribal communities. This bill helps uh, to ensure that the drinking water coming out of the faucets across the country is safe to drink, regardless of a neighborhood's uh, zip code or the economic status of its citizens. I especially want to thank uh, Senator Capito, Senators Capito, Duckworth, Lummis, and Cardin for their partnership and leadership on this legislation. Senator Cardin, uh, Senators Cardin and Wicker have helped to address uh, water affordability for people who are struggling to pay their water bills. We especially appreciate their efforts. I'm also proud that we're considering a bipartisan bill to name the Department of Transportation headquarters here in Washington, D.C. after the late William T. Coleman, the first African-American ever to lead that agency. Mr. Coleman brought to the U.S. DOT a special focus on improving life in our cities and lowering air pollution from our transportation systems. Today, we come together to recognize his lifetime of service to this country. Today, we're also considering a couple of the president's nominees. Up first is Brenda Mallory, who's been nominated to serve as chair of the White House Council on Envi Environmental Quality, or CEQ. No stranger to CEQ, Ms. Mallory served there for a number of years after after an impressive tenure of more than a decade at M EPA, including under uh, President uh, George W. Bush. She has earned respect from both sides of the aisle and would be the first African-American to lead CEQ if confirmed. I'm confident that Ms. Maori will ensure this, that bedrock protections for the National Environmental Policy Act are being fairly and adequately deployed to safeguard clean air and water throughout our country. She's an effective and proven leader who brings people together to find lasting solutions to some of our most pressing challenges. 13, no fewer than 13 past Republican CEO chairs and EPA appointees recently sent us a letter supporting Ms. Mallory's nomination. And I'll be proud to vote for her today. Somebody said to me, Shelley, I said, aren't any Democrats for her? And I said, well, a few, a few are. <laughs> but we got a ton of Republicans, so we'll see how it works out. But next, though, we are considering our president's choice for deputy director of the EPA, and that would be Janet McCabe. We'd be hard-pressed to find many others with Ms. McCabe's level of experience and understanding of the inner workings of this agency. After the chaos of the past four years, I have every confidence that Ms. McCabe is the kind of steady hand we need, working with Administrator uh, Michael Regan to rebuild morale and restore uh, scientific integrity in this agency. Another leader who enjoys support from across the political spectrum, uh, Ms. McCabe has been recommended by no less than nine people who previously served in the role for which she's been nominated. Five are Democrats and four are Republicans. Members of this committee have heard me say more than a few times that true leaders are humble, not haughty. They have the heart, uh, hearts of a servant and understand that their job is to serve, not be served. Brenda Mallory and Janet McCabe will each be that kind of leader, and I'm confident that they will serve the American people with integrity and humility. Let me just close, if I could, by noting how proud I am uh, today to lead this uh, committee and uh, with our, our, our ranking member, uh, Senator Capito. I believe uh, collectively we've shown uh, again today that we can come together across the aisle to help meet the pressing water infrastructure needs of the American people. We can do that with uh, our nominations before us, too, 
and throughout this entire process, Brenda Mallory and Janet McCabe have conducted themselves with dignity and honor. Neither of them have uttered a partisan or divisive word during the confirmation process, and I urge our colleagues to join me in supporting them today. And in the uh, unlikely event that they prove to be unreasonable or unresponsive, uh, should they be confirmed, we'll invite them to come back before this committee again and answer bipartisan questions, although I highly doubt that that need will arise. And just as this uh, committee comes together on water, uh, I hope we can come together to confirm these highly qualified nominees. I'm proud to support all the measures before us today and grateful to everyone who's worked on them, and I hope all of our colleagues will, uh, will join me in, in that support. And with that said, let me turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, and again, my thanks for all of your help and that of, of, of your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank members of the committee, and uh, thank you for your partnership in developing this water infrastructure bill and the subcommittees uh, that have worked on this. When you said uh, if they decided to be unresponsive or unresponsible, I thought you were talking about us. That's how, that's how bad it is. Uh, to, and, and actually, you were making reference to if if our nominees are not responsive, we'll bring them in front of the committee. So excuse me for my thought. Um, anyway, only two, two months into this Congress, uh, this committee is passing bipartisan common sense legislation through regular order. I think that's terrific. And I look forward at, to that same path that we're working on now on our surface transportation reauthorization bill. I want to talk about the two nominees, and uh, I don't think you'll be surprised when you and I have talked about this. Uh, I, I strongly support this legislation, but I do oppose the two nominees, Janet McCabe and Brenda Mallory. I do appreciate their willingness to serve and certainly don't question their integrity. The problem is I have concerns about the policy vision as it relates to my state and our country. As the architect of the Clean Power Plan, uh, Ms. McCabe has not shied away from her support for this overreaching policy. Just the opposite, Ms. McCabe has basically doubled down. In 2019, McCabe wrote an op-ed with Gina McCarthy and Joe Goffman, who is now running the air office at EPA, and we know that Gina McCarthy is the climate czar in the White House. Uh, McCabe supported rulemaking to, quote, deepen and accelerate CO2 reductions, a continuation of policies beyond the Clean Power Plan. She, that's right, in, in her opinion, this op-ed, the Clean Power Plan did not go far enough. West Virginia's Attorney General Patrick Morris Morrissey wrote a letter to Chairman Carper and me in opposition of Ms. McCabe's nomination. As the Attorney General stated, quote, there is a right and wrong path and a bipartisan rejection of this nomination is one of the ways we can steer the right course going forward rather to return to the mistakes of the past. I agree with our Attorney General. In 2019, my colleagues Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema voted against reinstating the Clean Power Plan. Opposition to the Clean Power Plan was and is bipartisan. And I, expo I expect policies that would be created by EPA, EPA under Janet McCabe's leadership would also have tough sledding. I think a fresh start with a vision of achieving environmental goals while weighing impacts would be a better start. So I cannot support um, Janet McCabe. I also can't support Brenda Mallory, and I appreciate her openness. We've had several conversations, as I have had with Ms. McCabe as well. Um, Ms. Mallory has stood against the long overdue re reforms of environmental reviews under the National Environmental Policy Act, known as NEPA. She voiced outright opposition to the Trump administration's NEPA rules, saying, quote, you almost don't have a choice but to remove the whole thing. She did not commit to a presumptive two-year time limit for completing environmental impact statements. We simply cannot be content with an average of seven years to complete an environmental impact statement for a highway project. Most in Congress agree that the NEPA process needs significant improvement. The truth is there is broad support for NEPA reform, from state governments to the American Road and Transportation Builders Association to North America's building trade unions. Those who want to address our transportation backlogs, grow our economy, and secure financing know certainty and clarity are needed. As I've said before, if we want to build back better, we have to be able to actually build. My opposition to Ms. McCabe and Ms. Mallory is based on fundamental differences of opinion I have with them about the direction of the country. Where I do agree with you, Mr. Chairman, is on the legislation we have in front of us today. Together, we can be an example for our nation of what bipartisan, thoughtful, and common sense policies look like. During last week's hearing, we heard from a panel of experts about challenges facing this country's drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. We also received testimony on solutions. I want to highlight just a couple of the themes that I heard from our witnesses. 
First, continued and additional funding is necessary for both the maintenance of existing drinking water and wastewater infrastructure and for the construction of our new projects. That said, funding must be targeted so that it reaches the communities with the greatest needs and maximizes return on our taxpayers' dollar. Second, investment in our nation's water workforce is vital to ensuring the effectiveness and longevity of water infrastructure investments. We heard about that from every single witness that we heard. I am pleased that this bipartisan, the, the bipartisan provisions in this bill that I have championed uh, with Senator Booker actually are these two issues that are included. Also high in importance to me and included in the bill is funding for decentralized wastewater systems. So many of our rural communities rely on these septic systems. This bill also invests in the operational sustainability and physical resilience of our water systems. We address the growing challenges posed by cybersecurity vulnerabilities to our drinking water supplies. So today's bipartisan package addresses these themes and I urge approval uh, by my, for my colleagues. I also am proudly supporting and co-sponsor of S-400, Senator Wicker's bill to name the Maine Department of Transportation building in Washington, D.C. after a truly dedicated public servant, Mr. William T. Coleman, Jr. So with that, I urge my colleagues to oppose both of the nominees today, but I strongly support both of these bills, and I thank you again. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask uh, Senator Wicker if he'd be willing to say a word or two uh, with respect to William Coleman. Uh, yes, and uh, I guess the microphone is on. Thank you, and I know we, are, we have uh, myriad tasks, and I don't want to prolong the vote, but I, I do think members need to understand what an excellent um, public servant we are honoring by moving this bill along to the floor. Uh, uh, William T. Coleman was an accomplished legal scholar, World War II veteran and civil rights leader. Before uh, he left his mark on history by becoming a cabinet secretary, Bill Coleman was the first African American clerk to the United States Supreme Court. As a young attorney, he worked on five cases for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that led directly to the court's landmark ruling in Brown versus. Board of Education. He was also co-counsel in McLaughlin versus Florida, a case that led to the end of state bans on interracial marriage. Bill Coleman later served on presidential commissions during the Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon administrations. Then in 1975, he was selected by President Gerald Ford to be the nation's fourth Secretary of Transportation and the first African American to hold this position. Upon his confirmation, Coleman became the second African-American to hold any cabinet-level position. Secretary Coleman provided a forward-looking vision for the future of transportation, spearheading the first comprehensive national study on transportation policy and several important reform efforts. The William T. Coleman, Jr. Department of Transportation Headquarters Act will name the Department of Transportation Headquarters after this groundbreaking leader. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for co-sponsoring, that includes Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, Senators Cantwell, Tim Scott, Booker, Warnock, Toomey, Casey, Sullivan, Inhofe, Duckworth, and Barrasso. This is a fitting tribute for a distinguished public servant, which will honor his legacy for many years to come. And I thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thanks so much, and thank you for the reminder of uh, the... Uh, the great role that he's played for our country, played for our country for all those years. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I want to ask us, uh, Senator Cardin, if he, and, and uh, again, I, I don't want to pick on you, Senator Worker, but if you uh, be, be willing to say a few words about the good work that the two of you have done with respect to affordability and, and uh, impoverished uh, communities as we try to uh, move this legislation forward, Ben? Well, thank you, um, Chairman and Ranking Member, for the bipartisan manner in which we're bringing forward very important legislation today. Uh, Senator Wicker and I work on many issues together, including global human rights, but we also work on the needs of the people in our own country. And I just want to congratulate the committee leadership for uh, forwarding legislation in a bipartisan manner, a tradition of our committee, uh, for drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. Critically important. And I want to thank you for including a provision that Senator Wicker and I authored to help low-income families in the, the affordability of their water bills. This is a pilot program based upon 
factual information that is required to be obtained in order to move forward with the affordability issue. So I, I want to thank the leadership for including that provision uh, in this legislation. We're happy to do it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wicker, a comment, please, on this? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, once again, uh, glad to be a teammate with my dear friend, and I urge the unanimous passage of this legislation. Thanks so much. All right. Um, Senator Duckworth, please. Thank you for uh, being our Democratic lead on this bill. Thank you. Well, I have to say um, thank you first and foremost, Mr. Chairman, to you and also to um, uh, Senator, Clark, uh, Senator um, Cardin for allowing me to lead this bill. It is very generous of you. It is so important to my home state where we are home to 25% of the lead uh, water lines in the entire nation. We have exponentially more lead water lines than any other state in the nation. And we are also uh, a state that sees significant um, injustice when it comes to our infrastructure and environmental injustice. So I just want to thank um, Chairman Carper for your very strong leadership and willingness to work with me in making a comprehensive water infrastructure bill a reality. I know that both you uh, all of us share a belief that to truly build back better, our nation must prioritize putting Americans back to work, repairing, upgrading the aging pipes we all depend on to deliver our water. I also want to thank Ranking Member Capito and Subcommittee Ranking Member Lummis for working with us to make our drinking water and wastewater infrastructure bill a truly bipartisan proposal that meets the needs of the diverse communities we represent. Of course, as I've said, the threat is particularly pressing in Illinois. My home state has the misfortune of containing more lead service lines than any other state in the country. In fact, over 23% of our nation's lead service lines may be located in Illinois. And furthermore, the city of Chicago is home to more lead service lines than any other city in the United States. I speak regularly both with Governor Pritzker and Chicago Mayor Lightfoot. In fact, I spoke with both of them just within the last 72 hours about this very issue. And they joined me in being ready and willing to fix this problem, but they need the federal government to step up. But it's not just the mayor of uh, Chicago, it is also the mayor of Peoria, the mayor of Alton, Illinois. It's the farmer who, works in El who farms in El Paso, Illinois. They all need clean drinking water as well. Our states and municipalities, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of red or blue state, are ready to tackle this issue and need we here at the federal level to do our part. A chilling Chicago Tribune report published last week revealed that between 2015 and 2020, tap water measurements in dozens of Illinois homes showed hundreds and even thousands of parts per billion of lead. These extreme levels match what researchers found during the same period in Flint, Michigan. As is with many problems in our nation, this lead contamination is often the worst in black and brown communities. Data from one predominantly black community in Illinois showed as much as 5,300 parts per billion of lead in the drinking water, and when the EPA action level is just 15 parts per billion, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention strongly warns parents that there is no safe level of lead exposure for a child. Years of failures to make adequate investments on a nation nationwide scale in our water infrastructure has led to a status quo where thousands of constituents, our constituents, are served drinking water through what essentially is a lead straw. This is a dire public health crisis and we must do more to stop it. In favorably re reporting our bill to the full Senate for consideration, this committee has taken an important first and significant step forward towards achieving our objectives. Of course, our work is not complete and I want to again express my appreciation for Chairman Carper for his commitment to work with me as we move to the floor to integrate and refine provisions to strengthen programs that help support full lead service line replacement in Illinois and throughout the country. Thank you again for your support in this effort, Chairman Carper. I look forward to making safe water a priority as we together get this Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021 across the finish line. Thank you. Senator thank you for that statement. Thanks for your leadership. And let me return, uh, before we go, we'll vote, we have a quorum and we're ready to vote. But Senator Lummis, let me just uh, yield to you for, for a statement as well, and then we'll start voting. Anyone who, uh, after that, who has something that you'd like to add to the record, uh, feel, uh, feel free. Senator Lummis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, wastewater, clean drinking water, safe drinking water are important to all of us, of course. Democrat, Republican, rich and poor, 
uh, in rural and urban areas. So I want to applaud everyone who worked on this bill, particularly our personal staffs, the committee staffs, minority and majority party both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Capito, and, and thank you, Rep or Senator Duckworth. It's very nice to work with you all. Thank you. Great I yield have, back. Great to have you here. All right. Uh, well, uh, anyone who would uh, like to speak after the, uh, the vote, you're uh, most welcome to do that. And, but uh, we have some folks who have to get to other, other hearings, uh, other uh, meetings for their voting as well. Uh, so now I'd like to call up presidential nomination 79-7. Uh, that is uh, Brenda Mallory of Maryland to be a member and chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. I move to approve and report the nomination favorably to the Senate. Is there a second? It's been a second, and uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Bozeman. No. Mrs. Capito. No. Mr. Card. Aye. Mr. Kramer. No. Ms. Duckworth. Aye. Ms. Ernst. No. Mr. Graham. Mr. Enhoff. Uh, no, Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Lummis. No. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Merkley. Aye. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders? Yes. Mr. Shelby? No, by proxy. Ms. Stabenow? Aye. Mr. Sullivan? No, by proxy. Mr. Whitehouse? Aye. Mr. Wicker? No. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman, the yeas are 11, the nays are 9. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'd like to call up presidential nomina uh, nomination 79-8, uh, uh, that of Janet McCabe of Indiana, to serve as Deputy Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. I move to approve and report the nomination favorably to the Senate. Is there a second? Second. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Bozeman. No. Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Aye. Mr. Kramer. No. No. Ms. Duckworth. Aye. Ms. Ernst. No. Mr. Graham. No. Mr. Enhoff. No, by proxy. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Lummis. No. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Sanders. No. Mr. Shelby. No, by proxy. Ms. Stabenow. Aye. Mr. Sullivan. No, by proxy. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Just, just a moment. The chairman of the yeas are 11, the nays are 9. Senator, uh, Senator Capito, would you just repeat what you just said to me, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, my mistake here when I voted, uh, when I said uh, Senator Graham's no vote, I should have said no by proxy. I would like to have that recorded as a proxy vote. Yes, ma'am. All right. Would you uh, restate, uh, Clark, restate the, uh, the outcome, please? All right, Clark. Yes. Yeah, would you just re restate the outcome, please, in the last Yes, one. the yeas are 11, the nays are 9. Well, that's, um, that's about as close as it gets, but uh, at the end of the day, it'll be a W for us, and I hope for our, for our country, I think so. So whether you voted yes or no, um, I'm glad we got this far. And I have a, uh, the opportunity to report out the nomination, and we'll have an opportunity to revisit. And my, I'm going to be encouraging both nominees. They clearly have some, some work to do in talking with our, especially our Republican uh, colleagues. And uh, to, uh, to, as we go uh, forward from this day, I want to make sure uh, they, that, that your voices are heard with, uh, with these nominees if they're confirmed. So thank you.
All right. With that, uh, well, let's turn to the uh, Drinking Water and Wastewater and Infrastructure Act. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. It was, uh, this was, we needed everybody here, so I thank you for coming. Um, Senator uh, Capito and I have agreed to consider uh, S. 914, which was introduced yesterday and is identical to the bill circulated to all members of the committee on Friday as the base text for the committee consideration. <clears throat> Therefore, by unanimous consent, S. 914 is considered the base text is your objection. Hearing none. I'm pleased that we're able to work with Senators Capito, Duckworth, Lummis, Cardin, and Kramer to resolve the outstanding issues with the circulated text. The bipartisan agreement is embodied in the Carpet Capito Amendment Number One. I move to adopt the Carper Capito Substitute Amendment. Senator uh, Capito and I have agreed to do this by voice vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. I now move uh, that the committee report S. Uh, 914, the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021 as amended. Is there a second? Second. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Bozeman. Yes. Mrs. Capito. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Kramer. Aye. Ms. Duckworth. Aye. Ms. Ernst. Aye. Mr. Graham. Aye by proxy. Mr. Inhofe. Aye by proxy. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Lummis. Aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Merkley. Aye. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Aye. Mr. Shelby. Aye by proxy. Ms. Stabenow. Aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Wicker. Aye by proxy. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, the yeas are 20, nays are zero. Did you say, say that again? I think you said 20 to zero. Was that 20 to zero? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the yeas are 20, the nays are zero. Was that, is that a unanimous vote, Clerk, Mr. Clark? That's good. That's great. Okay, folks, so we can be proud of that. I'm very proud of, of all of us and in particular our staffs who've worked on this. Final uh, business before us today, uh, the, the, the legislation, I should say this legislation is favorably reported. Thank you all. Final business before us today is uh, S-400, the William T. Coleman, Jr. Department of Transportation Headquarters Act. And I, uh, I move to a, a favorably report S-400. Uh, Senator Wicker, would you like to second that? He's not here. Uh, so, Adam. Second, second. All right, it's been moved and uh, seconded. All in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. I don't hear any nays. And then, depending on the chair, the ayes have it and the legislation is reported. Uh, the voting portion of our uh, meeting is concluded. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and for the hard work that's gone into this. And uh, uh, anyone who would like to make a statement at this point in time to uh, uh, Senator, uh, uh, please, Alex. Sure. Senator Padilla is recognized. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you and Ranking Member Capito and your staffs and the hard work that went into uh, you know, crafting this uh, significant bill that uh, we just acted upon. But uh, I want to take this opportunity, colleagues, to uh, call attention to the one million Californians who cannot drink their tap water due to contamination. I believe this bill will make a meaningful difference in helping deliver clean, safe drinking water to millions of Californians. In particular, I'd like to highlight some priorities of mine that are included in the legislation. Reauthorization of the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, known as WFIA, which has provided $3.3 billion in financing for California water projects. Grants to assist small and disadvantaged communities that do not have safe drinking water, which is critical as California enters yet another year of drought. And the new EPA pilot program for low-income water rate assistance, the Rural and Low-Income Drinking Water Assistance Pilot Program. And I particularly want to focus on this last one, given the water debt emergency facing my state and others across the country as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. One in eight California households currently have unpaid water bills, totaling an estimated $1 billion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, ask consent to submit a letter into the record from a broad coalition of California organizations, 
communities, and water agencies emphasizing the critical need to address this and other equity issues surrounding affordable, safe drinking water. I think the pilot program included in this bill is a good start, but we must do much more. Mr. Chairman, I hope to work with you and Ranking Member Capito on a bipartisan basis as this bill moves to the floor to include a permanent, long-term assistance program to help low-income Americans access safe drinking water, just like we have programs to help low-income Americans with their energy bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Padilla, would, would you make again your uh, unanimous consent request, please? Yes. Uh, uh, request to ask, uh, uh, excuse me, ask consent to submit a letter into the record from a broad coalition of California organizations, communities, and water agencies emphasizing the critical need to address this and other equity issues surrounding affordable, safe drinking water. Yeah. Without objections to order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thanks for your good work. Anyone else? Senator Kelly, did you have something you wanted to add, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to take a moment to uh, discuss the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021, of which I'm a proud co-sponsor. Um, recent data indicates that the drought conditions in Arizona and the entire Southwest are worse than they've been in 20 years. At a time when Arizona's population continues to grow, ongoing water shortages pose a serious threat to Arizona's economy and the livelihoods of all Arizonans. Yet. At a time when water conservation is so critical, most of our Arizona drinking water infrastructure is more than 30 years old. And Arizona's wastewater infrastructure is suffering from a $1.4 billion investment shortfall. To adapt to ongoing drought conditions, Arizona must make smart investments in our drinking water infrastructure to prevent leaks and water main breaks that waste our precious water resources and in our water infrastructure to support new advanced water reuse technologies. That's why I'm proud to co-sponsor the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act of 2021. This bill creates a $50 million grant program to help drinking water systems invest in climate resilience and cybersecurity technologies. It also requires that the EPA invest in research of new and emerging technologies to monitor system efficiency to prevent water loss. And the bill makes a significant investment in new alternative water source projects to help Arizona communities invest in desalinization, stormwater reuse, and wastewater reclamation facilities, which will be necessary to help Arizona maximize our scarce water resources. At the same time, <clears throat> this bill supports communities in need throughout Arizona. I'm glad that at my urging, this bill reauthorizes the Indian Reservation Drinking Water Program with a specific set aside for Arizona tribal, Arizona tribes located in the lower Colorado River Basin. And I'm pleased that this bill takes the first step towards creating permanent water utility bill assistance for low income households, what uh, Senator Padilla was referring to. Lastly, the sewer overflow and stormwater reuse municipal grant program that is included in this bill will help communities fix their failing water systems, wastewater systems. I hope to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Capito in the coming weeks to ensure there is dedicated funding within these programs to prevent sewer overflows in Arizona communities along the U.S.-Mexico border. It's a significant problem. And I appreciate that this bill provides the Arizona Water Financing Authority with the tools to finance water or wastewater system improvements in rural and underserved communities through grants, negative interest loans, and loan forgiveness programs. Now, this bill is not perfect. For example, it fails to address the systematic inequities inherent in the Clean, clean Water State Revolving Fund formula, which provides Arizona with just one-third of the funding to which we would be entitled if the formula was updated based on need and current population. So I hope to work with the committee in the coming months to fix this and close the gap. But this bill does take significant steps towards meeting the real and pressing needs faced by Arizona's water users. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, to you and to Ranking Member Capito, Chairwoman Duckworth, and Ranking Member Lummis for your work 
and the work of your staffs on this bipartisan bill. I yield back. Well, we thank uh, we thank you uh, as well. For your the new member, the the, op the opportunity to work on legislation of this consequence, and for us to uh, be able to report it out to unanimously. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, making a good bill even even better by your participation. Well, I'd like to you, say if, if it isn't perfect, make it better, and we will have some opportunity going to the floor to hopefully make it better still. And then as we work out our differences with the the House of Representatives on this subject, I um, have a, uh, I, let me just say. A lot of people, usually I take the train to come down here. Today we drove down in record time, almost, from uh, Wilmington, Delaware. But I'm not on, it's not uncommon for people to say to me as I'm standing on the platform at Biden Station in Wilmington, Delaware. People say, why, why, don't, uh, why don't you guys work together? Why can't you just work together? And I just want to say on something as important as drinking water, clean drinking water, and clean water itself. Uh, this is important. This is really important. And to be able to report out a bill of this consequence unanimously and prepare to go to the floor and ultimately, hopefully, pass a bill with strong margin there and take up uh, our differences uh, with the House and resolve those. I think that's, um, this is, this is a, a good start, a very, very good start. So we thank you for being uh, a part of, of that. Thank you, sir. All right, before, uh, before we adjourn, I, I have a, we have a, a, a ton of, a ton of uh, letters of support for, uh, for this legislation. We're grateful for all who have submitted letters of support, and I suspect that more, I suspect that more will come, but I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a number of letters of support for S914. They include letters from the American Public Works, Public Works Association, Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities, National Association of Sewer Service Companies, National League of Cities, National Association of Counties, United States Conference of Mayors, the National On-Site Wastewater Recycling Association, Water Environment Foundation, Water, Re uh, Re Water Reuse, National Rural Water Association, the American Water Works Association, Portland Cement Association, Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, the National Wildlife Federation, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, National Natural rather, Resource, uh, Resources Defense Council, Clean Water Action, Healing Our Waters, Great Lakes uh, Coalition, Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus, and finally, last but not least, the Rural Community Action Partnership. And uh, while I was a bit disappointed that, uh, that our committee supportive uh, nominations that we considered today was not unanimous, let me just say, because I'm just deeply grateful uh, to each member who did uh, find a way to vote for one or both of the nominees before us today. We're grateful for that. Brenda Mallory and Janet McCabe have conducted themselves uh, for decades now with deg dignity and honor uh, before this country and, and that, uh, I believe, before this committee. None of us is perfect. God, that certainly includes me. Uh, but they have served our country, I think, admirably. And if concerned, uh, confirmed, I believe they will do so again. Uh, and there's no one else who wishes to make a statement. So let me just close with this. People say to me, why is the federal government involved in, in this issue of of uh, clean drinking water and, and wastewater. And I tell them it goes all the way back to the um, Declaration of Independence, uh, written by uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, one of whom, uh, there was a, a, when they were actually having the vote on the uh, Declaration of Independence, the Delaware delegation was apparently deadlocked. And a fellow named Caesar Rodney rode his horse famously from Dover, Delaware, to uh, Philadelphia to cast a tie-breaking vote in favor of the Declaration of Independence. And there's as we all know, the, maybe the most fav famous words in the Declaration of Independence talk uh, to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, inalienable rights. And it's hard to have uh, life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness without water, without uh, clean water to drink. And uh, too many places around our country, Senator Padilla mentioned a million people out in California who are not drinking uh, clean, uh, clean drinking water. That's essentially this, everybody in Delaware. We've got about a million people. It's like having a whole state of Delaware where you have uh, folks who don't have, have clean drinking water. In this case, it's in one state out on the West Coast, where I used to, to live when I served in the Navy. But uh, whether it's California, big state, or Delaware, or Vermont, little states, uh, this is an important issue for uh, all of us. And this is not on, all on the federal government. It's not solely a federal responsibility. This is an all-hands-on-deck uh, deal. And uh, we need the support of state and local governments. We need the support of the utilities. Users themselves need to be paying into to, uh, for the, the cost of these uh, systems. And uh, together, uh, uh, we'll make it better. 
we'll make it better. And if it isn't perfect, uh, we need to do better still. So we'll keep working at it. I think that's it. Uh, uh, with that, I ask unanimous consent that the staff have authority to make technical and conforming changes to each of the matters approved today. And uh, uh, last thing, I, my, my, my mother would be disappointed if I didn't mention Matthew 25. When I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? And the, uh, the uh, it's, I mean, if, if the Declaration of Independence is enough of a compelling argument that, that what, what we're doing here is important and necessary, uh, my hope is that uh, Matthew 25 will, will do the job because we do have a moral obligation. And with the legislation authored uh, and offered uh, by uh, Senator Cardin and Senator Wicker, I think we do a better job of looking out for on the water side uh, for the least of these in, in our states and in our society. And with that, that I think we're done. And I would ask unanimous consent that the sta our staffs have the authority to make technical and conforming changes to each of the matters approved today. Thank you all for your participation in this meeting. Again, to our majority staff, John Kane, Annie D'Amato, Mackey to Lizzie, on the minority side to Travis, Jess, Adam, uh, and uh, I would say to another Adam over here, we, and to uh, Mary Frances Repco, our majority staff director. We are uh, deeply, uh, deeply grateful for all your good work. And with that, this, uh, this meeting is adjourned.